Cryostasis, Sleep of Reason has always been this game faintly in the back of my head. A not too well known title, but when it does get brought up, it's always fondly remembered. And so, I finally decided to get around to discovering what makes this fairly forgotten game well remembered by others. Released in 2008 by Ukrainian developers Action Forms, Cryostasis is a first person horror game. Set upon a Russian icebreaker stranded in the Arctic, it ends up being a fairly psychological and chilling experience, and it happens to be one that isn't necessarily easy to obtain these days. I've covered Abandonware before, and as usually the story, due to a lapse in licensing or perhaps an IP conflict, Cryostasis isn't purchasable from any of your typical game's retailers. Which is obviously what contributes to the game's obscurity, given you can't just come across it while browsing Steam anymore. And I think the lack of accessibility has contributed to me thinking about the game every now and then, taking up space in my head until the day I bothered to actually check it out. And honestly, I'm glad I did, as it turned out to be a highly creative horror game that surprised and impressed me on multiple occasions. Cryostasis begins with narration of a story that will follow you throughout your entire playthrough, this being The Flaming Heart of Dunko, a short story a part of Maxim Gorky's Old Isagil. You'll encounter parts of this story as you progress, and there's some obvious parallels between it and the game, but that's something I will touch on much later. The actual game begins with the protagonist, meteorologist Alexander Nesterov, locating the ship that was intended to bring him home from the North Pole, that ship being the Northwind, which has become stranded amongst the ice. And unfortunately, you as well find yourself falling victim to its hazards. Now trapped within the icy confines of the ship, your only chance of survival is to venture further into it for shelter, hoping to not only find a way out, but also discover what happened to the ship in the first place. And the first realisation that you'll come across here is that there's still people on the ship, although something deeply sinister has happened to them. Cryostasis more or less looks like your typical first person horror game, and honestly, it sort of is. The gameplay is split between exploring the insides of the ship, navigating its hazards, fighting the mysteriously reanimated crew, and some puzzle solving. Its combat features a small variety of weapons and melee combat that's serviceable, but still janky enough to make the game a challenge. You'll start off with just a chain and padlock where you're able to pull off some directional combos, until you upgrade to a hefty pipe valve, and then an actual weapon being the fire axe. They each have a different speed and weight to them which helps vary the experience of each. Melee is sluggish and rough yet still carries this visceral feeling of intensity as you violently pummel enemies down into the floor, and the fights bounce between easy and difficult because while enemy patterns are fairly easy to manoeuvre around, they tend to do a lot of damage when they do connect. Which brings me to the game's first unique mechanic, how it handles health. Being you're on a frozen ship in the midst of the arctic, the most precious resource in such a place is warmth, which is where you derive your health from. Throughout the ship there are warm areas and objects that serve as a refuge. Burning wood, lights and hot valves will allow the player to regain health. The amount regained is relative to the object, and it can be refilled up to the same amount as your temperature level, which is the outer red bar on your HUD. Combined with this, areas that are absolutely freezing, like the depths of a ship or outside, will lower your warmth and therefore health until you die. However, the sources of heat are infinite, meaning it makes sense to fight around them, and to backtrack to them in between fights. This becomes necessary as stronger enemies appear as you progress throughout the game, which is matched with the addition of guns. Featuring iconic Russian firearms such as a Mosin Nagant, the Mosin Nagant with a scope on it, the SVT-40 and the Pepysher, there's also a water cannon and a flare gun, which are not too effective and honestly nowhere near as satisfying. The introduction of guns for both you and the enemies changes things significantly, the combination of strong recoil, bullet sponges and overall janky controls makes for harder fights, yet they tend to be quicker and more enjoyable compared to melee. It's fun when you're able to move about the environment and use cover, but other times you're shoved into a hallway to face a firing line. There's also a decent variety of enemies throughout the game, each tending to have an optimal way to fight them. They'll range from vaguely normal looking crew members to genuine monsters. I dare say some of them are even scary and most of the time the combat made for an enjoyable yet frantic experience, having to flee a pursuing enemy as they scream at you and bullets fly. Something that works very well with the firearms is the unique HUD which accompanies it. Each gun has a visual display of its internal clip, how many of them you have, and the amount of ammunition within. On top of it just being a very nice thematic touch to the game, 
it adds the necessity of having to actually count your shots rather than simply relying on a number, which makes for a good addition to a horror game. Combining this with the game's temperature, health and stamina meters, and the lack of clutter elsewhere, and it has actually got to be one of my favourite HUDs in an FPS, as it has a good deal of being actually practical while retaining a good amount of thematic design behind it. Though one rather cheap feeling part of a game is the actual spawning of enemies. They tend to not exist in the world until you're right about to face them. If you're in the distance they'll just awkwardly pop in before beginning their animations, and if you're approaching a door or corner they tend to appear right behind it as you approach them and do a sort of scripted attack, which always seems to kill you no matter how much health you have. I imagine this was done to help deal with performance, but it feels pretty tacky as a result. I think it's a great concept to have enemies ambush you, but if the only way they could have pulled this off is by spawning them right in front of you, then I think it would have been better to not have it in the first place, as for the most part, it was dying to the surprise and then having to avoid it on the subsequent save. Which is funny to mention, because there's another mechanic in this game which is all about trial and error. The mental echo is some mysterious power that you inexplicably have. Throughout the ship, there are a horde of dead crew members whose memories can be entered, offering small glimpses of the crew's perspective of their last few hours on the ship. Not only can you relive these, but you can alter them. You can prevent the error that led to their demise, and change history by making the right crucial decision in that moment. Or you can make the same mistake they made, and have to repeat the same dream again and again. Some of these are simple, like going left instead of right, and some of them turn out to be fairly hard. They can be a good challenge, like actually having to solve some sort of puzzle or locate an item, and others are just cryptic, which will have you failing over and over until you look up a playthrough on YouTube. And the spacing between these segments can be really jarring sometimes. You can begin one, spend a minute or two completing it, then head down a hallway only to have to do another. It would have made more sense to either space these segments out or combine some. However, I still think it's a very good mechanic, as it not only allows for a unique way to introduce more exposition and show the perspective of more characters upon the ship, but it allows for more problem solving than just having to shoot enemies and walk down hallways. It elevates what is an okay game with a strong setting into something that makes for a much more unique and transformative experience, and actually led to some memorable moments, because while I've said the game is scary, the mental echoes of the abattoir were pretty compelling as far as horror scenes go. One of the things that makes Cryostasis stand out rather well, that has yet to be mentioned, is its visuals. For a game released by a small studio back in 2008, it's pretty good looking with some strong artistic design. There's obvious things that I can draw your attention to that aren't great, like the very flat and repetitive floor and wall textures, or a pretty aggressive noise filter at times, but I have to say these are fairly small downsides compared to what the game does well. There is also obviously a lack of variety in the scenery of the game, given it's all set on one ship. But I feel the constant metal corridors are more than made up for due to how much of a ship you actually experience. You go on a genuine adventure through the ship in its entirety, from the bottom of its bows to the top of a bridge. The engine room, the brig, kitchen, dorm rooms, every kind of place you'd expect on a ship, you experience. Which I feel does a great job for continuity, because you actually feel like you're making your way through this gigantic icebreaker, rather than just going from level to level. I've already mentioned how great the game's HUD is, but on top of this is the use of a light frost vignetting and visible breath depending on the character's temperature. There's also plenty of fog, snow and other effects, which all look pretty good still, and contribute well to the game's icy immersion. The next notable feature is the game's lighting. Given the cramped interiors of the game, good lighting was necessary, and I feel they pulled it off. The variety of natural sunlight, machinery, fire, hot objects and everything else on the ship looks great. And it's used effectively to convey the current mood of scenes. Warm red glows are prevalent as a symbol of safety and progress for the player, while less colourful and flickering lights tend to indicate danger ahead. The warmest of areas are the most visible, while the outside has much of the screen obfuscated and desaturated to amplify the actual danger of the cold. These are minor things, but I feel the ship would feel much less threatening if these features weren't implemented well. The prevalence of icicles are used creatively as well. They serve as temporary obstacles and inconveniences for the player, to be broken apart as a door is violently thrown open, or melting away when power is restored in an area. 
with a way ahead often being highlighted by a red, hot door. It's all really just a subtle way to underline your progress and show you how you're gradually restoring the ship. Enemies glow red where they've been struck by bullets, and in contrast the player screen flashes blue with ice cracks when damaged. It's all to demonstrate the battle between the two extremes of hot versus cold, which is obvious, but I feel it's worth mentioning as it's done very creatively. Another impressive feat is the game's physics. Of course it's fun to kick about barrels and debris as you walk about, but it's utilised a bit better than that, as enemies tend to collapse and ragdoll, often falling from above, or when fighting larger enemies, which walk through and push about the environment as they trample towards you, and how locker doors swing about and recoil from gunshots gone wide. It gives a good amount of life to what is otherwise a slow, cramped game. But at times it feels perhaps a bit too over the top, where in some action sequences everything seems to go wild, objects colliding and flying about, icicles exploding and a monster barreling towards you. I feel I'd be able to appreciate it more if it didn't so obviously impact the game's performance. Just navigating the game calmly, it runs at a steady 60 frames, but as more and more happens on screen, the frame rate begins to plummet. I mean apparently this is the first game ever to use Nvidia's real-time water physics, and I mean that's cool and all, but it comes at a pretty obvious cost. Combine that with all the particle effects, physical objects and flashing lights, and a good amount of the game is spent with an inconsistent frame rate. This doesn't even appear to be an issue of modern drivers or hardware even, as I read about similar issues closer to the game's release. Unfortunately, that's not the only issue that plagues the game. The aforementioned flashing lights are really bad in certain areas, to the point where it actually gave me a headache. I certainly hope this is some unintentional issue of playing on a modern system, because if this is how it's intended to be, then it's kind of just terrible. And the final bad mark that held the game back was frequent crashes. While I'm aware that recording software and your computer's system can often contribute to a game's instability, at certain points in time I was crashing every few minutes with little reason as to why, which made this 5-6 to six hour game feel much longer than it actually was. Fortunately, this small fix seemed to remove almost all the crashes I had, and I recommend basically always checking out the PC gaming wiki for when playing older games as there's almost always ways to help optimise it. So, I would say all three of these performance issues are pretty significant, and while it doesn't make enjoying the game impossible, it certainly puts a hamper on getting fully engaged into the experience, and I can now see why the game's initial reception is that it was just okay, rather than amazing, which is a shame, because it's evident that the game was mostly held back by performance issues, rather than design choices or its writing. And while there's a lot of impressive tech in this game, I just wish it had been better optimised. The plot and general writing of Cryostasis genuinely surprised me, and it went in a direction I was very much not expecting, though if you feel inclined to play the game at some point, I'd recommend skipping to the conclusion and saving the experience for yourself. Otherwise, let's get into what I consider a pretty memorable and worthwhile story. Despite being a fairly short game, there is a lot going on plot-wise, as you have the experience and perspective of a protagonist, that of a ship's crew seen through flashbacks and mental echoes, the story of Danko, as well as the captain's own personal journal, which means there's a lot to consider as you're given varying impressions of the same events from different points of view. Through the protagonist, their flashbacks and delving into the memories of a regular crew, you experience the reality of a ship, a giant old vessel that is struggling to stay together amidst a perilous voyage. You're shown all the various hazards and accidents that occur which the crew try to deal with during their final hours, and it's honestly kind of interesting and compelling even, to feel an ounce of sympathy for these nameless, one-scene characters as you witness them desperately scrambling to fend off the inevitable death that encroaches around them, and it's clear having to play through their perspectives definitely contributes towards feeling this. There are then the recurring characters of a ship's captain, the first mate, the chief engineer, and head of security. These individuals have multiple flashbacks for the protagonist to witness, but unlike the rest of the crew, you are unable to intervene due to the lack of their bodies. The captain is depicted as an out of touch old man who is disdained by his peers, but is leading his crew to certain death travelling through a dangerous path on the sea. And at first, that's very much how I saw him, a stubborn boomer who thought he knew better than everyone else. And it makes sense to have that perspective, given what you've seen of a regular crew and the thoughts from the head staff. People are dying, the entire ship is in danger, and he continues to lead them straight towards their demise. That is until you're able to read more of his journal and get to understand his point of view. 
which is when the parallels between the game and Dunko's Flaming Heart become very clear. I will put in a link to the full story in its entirety for you to read, but the abridged version is, Dunko volunteers to lead his tribe through a deadly forest after they are violently removed from their home. They are put into high spirits due to his courage, but as they delve deeper into the forest and as circumstances worsen and lives are lost, Dunko proceeds to lead on bravely despite all of this. His followers turn against him, believing that he has led them astray. I'm sure it's already evident, but the juxtaposition between Dunko and his tribe and the captain and his crew is pretty crystal clear. The perilous waters and the iceberg ahead being their dangerous forest. The story of Dunko ends as his tribe go to kill him, but wanting to show his own passion and dedication for his people, he tears his own heart out, which is then set aflame. The light of it burns back the insidious forest and unveils an endless step for his people. He manages to let out a joyful laugh before dying. His followers do not notice his death due to rejoicing at the miracle, though one happens to see it, and in fear of not understanding what had happened, stomped on the flaming heart, which unleashed a shower of sparks before going out. If we are to follow the parallel of the story, then the captain does try to lead the crew to safety, and gives his life as the ultimate sacrifice to save them, which is sort of what happens. Through the intervention of the protagonist, who is able to save dozens of lives through his mental echoes, one of the most significant of these is preventing the helicopter on the ship from crashing. This change in history gives a possibility for the head crew to escape the forsaken ship, and they bring the dying captain on board with them, who had incurred lethal injuries during the impact with the iceberg. As you follow from the bridge to the helicopter pad, the path the dying captain was taken, where the ground itself looks to be overcome with heat, he quotes Ecclesiastes 11 and 12. The book of Ecclesiastes, in summary, highlights the value of appreciating what is good in life, because there will be a time when you cannot, and although there is much bad in the world, there is always a light beyond it. The captain says to cast thy bread upon the waters, which is to give selflessly without expectation of return. Going back to his journal writings, it is very easy to see the philosophy of Ecclesiastes prevalent throughout his reflections and makes his desire to forge onwards more understandable. This mindset then shares further parallels with Dunko, to see the good beyond the bad, and to give selflessly without return. Both characters achieve this as they give their life to save others. As the helicopter ascends, I believe that the captain in a sense, tore his own heart out, and you, the protagonist, are what set it aflame. This is reinforced with the final line of the story, being uttered as you stand over the ruined remnants of the ship's nuclear reactor. With him having died there, you're finally able to use your mental echo power on him, and have an epic boss battle with Kronos for Titan of Time. I think needing big boss battles for the end of a game was just a product of the times back then, because although I was extremely surprised and I thought it looked very cool, it was also a bit jarring. But I understand that metaphysically, whatever controls time, is likely pissed off that you keep on manipulating it just so you can get your ride home. So, after defeating Kronos by shooting balls at the crewmates before you wax them, I suppose you convince him to let you alter one more thing, where you are given three choices which can all change the course of the ship's fate. You are able to influence either the first mate, chief engineer or head of security in the interactions with the captain, which helps mend the relationship between the characters. I feel this is a rather touching way to solve things, and doing this obviously greatly alters the past. It causes a butterfly effect which ultimately leads to preventing the crash and saving countless lives. And after doing so, you find yourself back at the start, finding the north wind to take you home, although this time there are people waiting by it. Keeping in mind that the ship's incident happened back in 1968, and you're looking for it in 1981. I suppose the ship was stranded in time, as much as it was the ice. There are leftover questions obviously, like why you're looking to board a ship that's been gone for 13 years, and are the enemies on the ship actually real? And honestly, these don't have to be solved. It's good to keep people wondering, and given the constant time travel shenanigans, it's likely futile trying to come up with the perfect reason. Maybe the enemies on the ship are simply allegorical for the dangers that are a part of Dunko's journey, and aren't actually there. Maybe they're the ghosts of the dead crew members who continue to haunt the ship as they're unable to move on. Maybe you yourself died at the beginning and this is all from the perspective of the afterlife. Or maybe they're real when there were just a lot of big dudes on the ship that dual-worded pepishes. My point is, 
Despite the game being over, it still has you thinking about it and asking questions, which is a sign of a well-written, compelling story. Regardless, I think I can say that the game definitely delivered way beyond my expectations story-wise, and it's been a while since I've played something that was so succinct yet impactful in its storytelling and message. A genuinely touching experience about the human struggle and the value of faith and perseverance in the face of a seemingly doomed journey, an absolute gem of a story, hidden behind an obscure game that not enough people have played. For what is ultimately a short, 5-6 hour experience, Cryostasis Sleep of Reason ends up being a deeply impactful and memorable game. Featuring an amazing story, a handful of unique and compelling mechanics, as well as a standout setting, which I feel is definitely worth playing for yourself despite its mediocre clunky combat and performance issues. It comes from the good old days when linear story-driven shooters were still a popular thing, when long play times and open worlds were more of an ambition than an expectation, and it reminded me of great games like Bioshock and Singularity, although obviously on a much smaller budget, and I'm glad I got to shed a bit more light on this game, because for all its flaws, I think it is an amazing, obscure experience that's not only worth remembering, but kinda hard to forget. I went in expecting a horror shooter set on a cold ship, but I was quite surprised with where the game went, and how its mechanics helped take me there. <laughs>